Hi everyone, welcome back to Beef Reacts, and um, today we're going to be doing it. Um, I talked earlier about trying to do more of like an analysis video. Um, now, issue with that is there wasn't as much time to prepare, so I think going forward what I want to do is start collecting my thoughts as I go along. This way it's less work in terms of... Um, collecting my thoughts and trying to like make something so this one's going to be a little bit jankier than the rest also just because it's the first one but um yeah so i thought what would be best practice is to uh break down the opening from a thematic pacing standpoint like i think the opening theme reveals a lot of what the season's journey is going to be about and just its visual storytelling and then i think the best way to uh, showcase that is I picked three scenes from the arcs shocker all of them are the fight scenes but I think ultimately this season is your introduction to the world so it's it's a lot of setup but there's even if the first song for the theme is about the four girls I think what makes art work very well and what makes music very impactful when combined with images is that it changes meaning completely and you can reuse and repurpose art to kind of mean anything um if you're skilled enough but yeah so let's just jump into it and um i think you'll see what i'm going for here in a little bit <laughs> knowing what this is about um and the uh, and the white kind of being a representation of of her mother um that is the i would say the objective look at it but another way you could look at this from just analytical perspective and for what it's building up about the season because what you know because it's been revealed after the fact to re um recontextualize like this opening and this scene doesn't change the meaning that's garnered if you don't know that stuff you know what i mean so like ultimately this is this is ruby looking ahead and my initial thought was that she was looking at a future version of herself like this is because the first line is you know they see you as small and helpless they see you as like um a child they see As just a child and she's looking towards the future somebody standing confidently in this wind that she's not able to get up in so i've kind of always got in my mind while watching this show that the the opening um the opening theme is basically for this season for this volume it is going to be the character slowly coming into their own or kind of walking towards that and i think this opening shot shows that for ruby very well so that's as the moon turns red saying she is on like kind of that path towards being the white um like not it's weird using color here but like that that white cloaked version which is her mother so now it's her walking in her mother's footsteps or work and now we're getting the reuse and now we're about to get the um the trailer footage so like yes we've we've seen all of this before but just because it's been reused we see Weiss during a like royal test. We're seeing Blake, and like we're seeing Gang. We're being introduced to our characters, and now we see the monsters that that they'll be fighting and the main antagonist. So everything's working together to tell you, as an audience, right before we even get started, what this show, or at least this volume, is going to be about. This light is actually atrocious on my face, but like um. That's at least what they're what they're going. For. So 
So it says, we are lightning, and I believe it's a straying from the thunder here. And they're showing, so when they're saying straying from the thunder, they're showing the white fang and like, at least the people that are fighting. And this scene has always been not one of gripe with me, but one of fascination. Not the fighting here, but I... Because, like, we were introduced to the four girls and how they're the fighters. And, and they're the ones going through it. And now we get our boy, uh, John Ar Joan Arc. So this will be the day. So, like... This will be the day you're waiting for. Now, if you look at John, a lot of people say that he's gaining inspiration, but this isn't a face of inspiration. This is like a face of betrayal. Like, it kind of looks like he... Like it, 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 the first time you see him, you get this angle looking down on him, which is kind of like he's not as good as the others. And it, and it's like slowly... Whoops, I accidentally muted that. Uh, it's slowly coming to eye level, but he's still looking down. Like, he's coming up slowly and becoming better. And then what we get is uh, Pira touching him, and now they're in a completely different spot, as in she is his equal, and she will be the one. Because now he's above the camera line. So, like, now now that she's with him, she's the one that rises him above and gets him to, like, a a level of equal, or not above standard, like, standard, but, like, a, above what he was. And, um... You could look at it and be like, well, that's, like, way too overly analytical. That's way too overly critical. Sure, but regardless of if it was intended or not intended, the fun thing about art and the fun thing about movies is that it just makes it just makes sense. It's always going to just make sense. Like, if you have something that you think this is about, you should typically trust your gut feeling because that's probably what it is. Like... Each angle has meaning in like in cin like cinema terms, but like each shot composition followed into another shot comp composition gives like another meaning. So like we're seeing the statue, we're seeing these warriors that you can look up to, but that means that they're also like we see him looking up to them. Like this is hopeful, but now we're seeing their perspective as you are not one of us. And slowly rising up until he gets there and now they're like on equal footing and as a team it's an up angle which is supposed to be giving them um a sense of like gravitas so it's like as a team they will be working very well together and be very strong together and then they look up at the man who's looking down on everyone the man with the fucking plan Osman with the Now we're getting all the insignias, which I think are just cool, and all the characters going into that. With, this is just ultimately a something cool to look at. Um, it they wanted a title card, and like, damn, got a title card that works. Um, but ultimately, I think what I think what this first volume was about was growth into oneself, and every character needing to be a little bit not be a little bit better but like start their journey like i think what they wanted to accomplish ultimately was this is our world this is what's cool about our world and that's why the fights are so dopely done and then because you can't just be like okay this is what we could do that's kind of what the trailers were for now we have to say well what's our story gonna be and for Ruby and John, I think it's very much coming into their own as leaders, at least in the beginning, to learn that everything's not about them, and it's it's they have to do things for other people, which is outright said by Ruby to Joan. And John, fuck, dude, get better. You can do this. Um, I think Weiss and Blake had... Not Blake. Not Weiss and Blake. I think Weiss and Blake had similar arcs on very different sides of the same coin in a way. So like, I mean, one, 
second here. Um, I'm like breaking off of how, I, how I'm thinking about wanting to do this. But like what I mean is I think Weiss and Blake was learning how to not follow in a way, but like Weiss, obviously, as we know in the beginning, thinks that she could be cap captain leader leading the squad. And Blake has leaves at one point. So both of them, you have one that is subversive and you have the other one, which is abandonment in a way. And um, we'll get into that probably in a little bit. I'm just trying to give you guys the lowdown of how I'm thinking of going about it at first. All right, let me get to the next part and we'll see where we're going. Hi, everyone. So we're back. This time, the first thing I wanted to go over was the Deathstalker and Giant Nevermore fight. Um, just because I think, as everyone said, that's the buy-in point for the show. But I, it's not just the buy-in point. I think it also does serve as setting up the group dynamics and what we're going to see branching out. And um, how I feel about this going forward is you have your opening theme that you watch every single episode. And that is giving you at least a, a bigger overarching theme for the first volume, which I think is kind of symbolic in a sense of like growing into itself. Like the show's figuring out what it wants to be. The characters are figuring out what they want to be. And they're slowly getting to that point. Um, and so like the first season is just them getting used to each other and going for it. So I think this encapsulates that very well. Also, any fucking excuse to watch the Deathstalker and Giant Nevermore fight, again, I will take going forward. I will rank fights later. I will do what I have to do to see them do a combo attack and rip a and, and rip someone's and decapitate somebody. I will do what needs to be done to see it. I accidentally ended my recording, but I didn't do anything else, and I realized it immediately. God, I I hate pointing. Pointing. Yeah. God, it's still sick. You gotta give them props for having that much fucking faith in Nora. Like, I don't... I, they just seem like a power couple to me. Active. I don't know. They just do. John giving out orders the first time around and I don't want to miss it this time because I genuinely just didn't even think about it. Yeah, I was clouded by my hatred. I'm going to try not to be so hating right now. Yeah. Man, we got to get over there. They need help. So he's the one who says we got to get over Let's there. Let's do this. Yeah, but, uh, I can't make that jump. <laughs> Whoa! So this is what gets, uh, obviously the groups together and everything. Uh, I still want to... It's still so cool. <laughs> did do an after image. Uh, I really did just never notice that, did I? Oh. That's 
cool because they never bring attention to it. So now we have It's our... tougher than it looks. Then let's hit it with everything we got. So we're seeing them come together in like this first time and like it seems goofy to say it like that but like what I'm ultimately getting at here is what we're seeing from a thematic pacing standpoint is we're halfway through we now have our teams established we have our people that we need together and this is them coming into their own as a team for the first time also done yet is we haven't set up team dynamics so now we're going to watch you know it's kind of like a crucible a trial by like fire thing so they're going through this none of this is working and the and the fucking badass music comes back in. I have a plan. Cover me! We gotta move! Okay. I have a plan. Cover me! We gotta move! So John, John's the one who says we gotta move. I thought it was Ren saying. Okay, I see what you guys mean now. Also, the instrumental is still so fucking badass. So, this is also uh, Team Juniper coming into its own as well, where we see John giving the orders of what to do, but each person is still kind of hot, like hyper competent in a way where it's like, without having to say a word, uh, Pyrrha still hit the guy through the eye. Like, they're still attacking and doing what they have to do. But once he actually comes in, he says what to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> Such a good fucking song. But I do feel like in this situation, like their team comes together, their team dynamic does come together and they grow into their own a little bit. It doesn't change that John isn't really um, feeling like he belongs. Like this entire arc is him showing why he really shouldn't be there. He doesn't know what aura is. He doesn't have the same natural abilities as everyone else. He just has a sword that was handed down from his grandfather. Like, it doesn't necessarily work as well in a team dynamic, and he still has a lot of growing to do this season, which we're going to see next. I just want to watch them fight, because it's sick. Fuck <laughs> yeah, On a side note, do you guys think Ruby's got tinnitus? Like, because uh, it's a hell of a thing, and she just shoots a fucking fifty cal sniper rifle point blank around her ears constantly, and that can't be good for her. Of course, you would come up with this idea. Cause it's can sick. Hmm. Can I? Can? Of course I can. <laughs> Nothing 
to get you a hyper than this moment. But, um, so, like, this, this shows Ruby at its best. And this is, I think, ultimately, where we start with our intro is, hey, this is a season about what we could be. And then our first part, which is right here, is we got the teams together, we got our characters, we introduced our world, and now let's show you as a team what we can do given time, money, and a budget. I shouldn't say time, money, and a budget. Time, money, and people. What can we do? And they showed these two scenes, and they're very different fighting choreographed scenes that just... just ooze personality, ooze style, and just give you everything you want. And so, that's them coming into at least their fight choreography, and that's also the team coming into their own shape and form. Next, we're going to see, hey, what about writing? Can we can we handle writing? Can we, can we do something besides make a fucking dope fight? And... It's funny because I use the end of the arc, which is a dope fight, but, like, you'll see what I mean. I'll be right back. I jumped the gun. We have, like, one last thing to show here. That's, I'm so sorry about that. I got jitters, guys. I'm a little nervous. I'm a little nervous to do this. So now we have Ruby Stand Up, who is the main character, the character the show's named after. Wow. You have this team realize that they're pale comparison, low-key. And then you have Ruby just standing up there showing herself to the world. Not that she's looking down, but it's like, this is who we're going to be following the journey of. Like, it's all of these characters, but it's ultimately Ruby's story. And it works on a lot of different levels, and it works very well together. Well, that was a thing. And obviously Yang doing the humor there, but anyway, so... That was just the last bit. Now we get over. Hey, can we write? Okay, so now what I wanted to do is go over at least uh, the Joan disc arc, I guess. And, like, there was no fighting during it. And a lot of the stuff was just kind of character driven around, personally, the weakest character of the season, which is Joan. And we got a lot of his backstory that he didn't belong there. He faked his transcripts and he, he just wanted to fight and be able to do this, but he isn't capable. And so he begins getting bullied by Cardin Winchester, who's as we know, a piece of shit and deserves worse. Um, starts getting bullied by him, starts being blackmailed by him. And now this is the culmination of that arc that we're about to watch. And we're seeing Joan come into his own as a leader and as a character. Like, we're seeing his arc. He's not perfect. And that's what I really love about the first volume is that they don't make their characters perfect. Like, it's a 12-minute runtime, so you have to balance that a little bit. Because it's hard, it's hard with 12-minute runtimes to really do in-depth storytelling or in-depth arcs unless you've made the decision the conscious decision to um serialize which is every single episode has meaning like over the garden wall is a much much better fucking story than most other 12 minute long uh series just because of the nature that it's that it's capable of being episodic, but everything feels off, and there's kind of like an overarching story that you're not sure of until you get to the end. And that's kind of what makes it so good. And a lot of future Adventure Time gets very similar treatment. Um, and I don't mean like future Adventure Time in the sense of like distant lands. I mean future Adventure Time in like seasons like mid six through the end. Basically, it, it gets more towards that rather than the episodic nature that it was. Um, here, they just wanted to set it up. And without the fighting, it gets like a little eh. But it's still interesting to go over these themes of bullying. And that even the leader of a squad, like even, even somebody who's in charge can be 
taken advantage of, which is which is a kind of a weird spot to be in. Like, you know that part. wasn't very smart, Johnny boy. I'm gonna make sure they send you back to mommy in teeny tiny pieces. I don't care what you do to me, but you are not messing with my team. And that's him taking the words that Rupi said earlier and realizing that this isn't about him anymore. So you can even have it because if Monty's one of the people that writes it, this could be his own views on leadership in general where it's like, hey, this isn't about me. This is about my team. Like it can hurt what you do to me can hurt what you do can not be necessarily the nicest or greatest thing, but you're not going to hurt the people that made this with me and that's definitely reading into it too too far but like that's kind of what makes storytelling such an amazing medium to be a part of is that it can mean a million different fucking things to a million different what? people you think like, talk that like makes that it makes exciting. you tough you think you're a big strong man now <laughs> his smile there has always made me think that he's pissing himself I don't know why, but like, look at his smile. <laughs> this isn't, this, this has, this is not productive at all, but I don't know why. Like he's peeing. He's just, <laughs> he's just now I still don't know what that means. What I guess is that he's finally learned how to control his aura or he just has a lot more than we know he has. Let's see how much of a man you really are. Now, did he heal from his injuries because he let out his aura like that? Or did he learn how to... You know, it would be really cool if he could pinpoint his aura and make him, like, a great adept, like, hand-to-hand -hand fighter. So now we have a massive person who's coming after Cart and his Cart is the first. That's a big Ursa! And this shows, um, I get that they're all named after birds and stuff like that, but, like, this shows the quality of leader that Cardin is. Do you think a single one of Team Juniper would run away from this? Do you think a single one of the Ruby Gals would run away from this? No, because they are a team, and they, and they understand the assignment. Like, they're running away. They're not even, they're not even helping the person that's supposed to lead them. That is absolutely... A statement like regardless of if it's intentional or not it's a statement it's a statement that you're making in art so like Cardin and we're seeing we're seeing this this writing standpoint like now Monty's team is saying like look we can do fights here's us doing writing and writing an actual arc we can do that too and we can do it better than most and here's the culmination of that arc right doesn't have a weapon anymore so now john has to make that decision dude i don't have to tell you guys this but like john's making the decision to save or run away did you guys hear that and this is and Ursa, again this Ursa. is him growing what? Him Where? stepping there, into his God role as a leader, where leaders need to not Sean. only lead for themselves or their team, Yang, but for everyone else like, around them. So he's Dewey. being a leader to fucking harden Winchester and being a decent human being and saving him. Like, it's a lot more than just one little thing. And it would take... Crap, crap. It would probably take me 50 watches of Volume 1 to be able to figure out every tiny little nuance that went into this show. Not because of... Like being oblivious but it's it's because that's what it takes to truly understand something it takes an obsessive mindset oh no and like i'm scratching the surface because i just i want to do this very badly but like him stepping in front of the shield why does he have a shield and sword is it because joan arc had a shield and sword sure but like He's able to attack and defend, and the point of a shield and sword is to is to wait for openings and go. And that's what he does here in general. Wait. And he 
keep going. love that scene and that's with what makes this beautiful too is that good teammates like yes you can have a captain and you can have people that are helping your captain but like it's it's a trust exercise like they trust him to lead and he trusts them i don't want to say to follow but like when i say follow what i mean is do what needs to be done to get the objective whatever that is done and like um you can always look at it i love that you have pure hold back i believe that was weiss and luckily i can go back and see it's weiss so you have weiss who's gonna step in and it's interesting because she was the character who felt like she needed to be the leader and had to learn to follow and it's nice that you have Pyrrha, who kind of, I think, is going to end up being a foil for Weiss in a, in a bit of ways. And it's nice when you have a lot of different characters foiling each other and doing things for each other. But, like, ultimately, this was, I think this is the team coming into itself. And, not coming into itself. This is John, the weakest character from this volume, stepping up, realizing he can be a leader. He can do these things. Even... If it was secretly helped by Pira, why does that matter? Because it it's a self-confidence issue. And him being bullied, also a self-confidence issue. Like, and I don't mean that as in if you're, if you're actually being bullied that way, you have self-confidence issues. That's not the point. I'm saying that his bullying stemmed from a self-confidence issue. He could have stopped Cardin Winchester at any single point in time. He was stronger than Cardin. He was better than Cardin. But the only person that could really see that was Pira. And she might nudge him a little bit without him knowing, but who cares? Like, who who cares if you have some small bit of help to get you where you're going? That's a good thing. That means people give a fuck. We could. Or perhaps we could just keep it our little secret. And he still helps him up. Yeah, Holy look at crap. John, don't ever mess with my team, my friends, ever again. And look at him. The second he gets that self-confidence, he isn't the worst anymore. Got it? You gotta love it. You, you gotta love it. Ah, it's, such a, it's such a good... And then we have to walk in, walk... It just And slow zoom out. Oh. God damn. So, that was that part. Which is, I keep reiterating because it's it's like time goes by and it's like, I don't know if we'll, the message is getting lost here. It's the theme, which is, this is going to be a show. This first volume is about people stepping into our own. And it's also about the writers, creators, and Monty himself stepping into his own as a creator. Because even if this isn't his first project, because I, I, I I'm interested in seeing other projects he's done. But it's like, it's still a small team with a small budget, so they're always going to have an, I don't want to say an underdog mentality, but they're always going to have this mentality of, we need to prove ourselves, and this is our opportunity to do it. And they prove themselves that, hey, we can make a fucking dope-ass fight. They showed that in their first. Now they're like, hey, we can do really good fucking art, like arcs. And then... They did this. Now the last one, which is the Blake. I believe this is them saying we can set up really interesting world building. Fights and character development all at the same time. And that's going to be the end of the first volume. So the next one's going to be the fight uh, between Penny, Blake, and Son. First, I cannot remember that guy's name, but him. So, be back in one second with that. 
And now, so, uh, this is the fight with Blake, Sun, and Penny versus uh, Torchwick and the White Thing. And so, I think this was to not only set up a second volume, but it's also to say, like, look, the last 15 chapters, we have shown you everything that we could do. We have pulled out every fucking stop imaginable. And now we're going to put it all together. And this is... And this is the Monty team. Like, this is what we could do. Um, and that's at least what I think the first volume was about, was just showcase as much talent as humanly possible. Now, there's 40 other things I could get into, but I felt like this is an overview analysis for the first one, just because I'm still a little nervous with this. Um, made the most sense. I love the bazooka. It's sick. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> so, what makes this scene really nice is that we're talking about a Faunus uprising and how the White Fang are this, like, a pseudo-terrorist group fighting for equality for Faunus against, against bad people. And what makes it interesting is that you have someone now who is an old participant in that fighting against what they think is the current leader who's who's a human i can't who's a human and current leader what they're thinking and you have another faunus who's fighting because he think he just thinks it's wrong like he thinks what they're doing is wrong also that they're going to try to kill him leave her alone and we're also getting character development during this because you have son who's Obviously a bit of a charmer, but it's like he's fighting. We're seeing his fighting style, so his personality is flippant, and acrobatic. He is adaptable. He's looking at the situation. You are not the brightest banana in the bunch, are you, kid? <laughs> like he's very good at using his surroundings. He's adaptable, and I think that works even better because his weapon, the gunchucks, are fucking sick. No, I'm kidding. They work because they're adaptable. It's a staff, it's or it's two nunchucks. Like that. <laughs> also, his fighting style is worse than that. So, does he have a billy club that's just... A bazooka. <laughs> but like, they're fighting together. They're working together as a team to take down. So, I think what you're getting thematically. <laughs> down the line is if faunus and humanity can find common ground and work together and you have a sect of people that just genuinely want equality and that's again you're doing much bigger storytelling on a much smaller scale and you're also having it somewhat act as hey look this is what we could do and like that's what works it's not just it's not just good on one level it's good on the biggest level you could imagine and on the smallest Hey! Oh, hello, Red. Isn't it past your bedtime? Ruby, are these people your friends? Penny, get back! <laughs> Love Penny. Penny, wait! Don't worry, Ruby. Now, this was just because they wanted... I think they wanted to introduce a new character to get people hype. And then be like, hey, we're we're going to have so much I'm more... I'm combat ready.
I realized it was fucked up that dude. Ultimately, this comes down to a question. And honestly, if you guys got this far, thank you so much. I know a lot of it's been rambling. I know a lot of it... Let me move this. Just move my microphone. I know a lot of it's been rambling. I know a lot of it's been, like, a little unfocused. For the next one, I want to do something completely different, in a sense. Um, same thing with the soundtrack. Next one, what I want to do is listen to the full song... And go back and do line by line. Um, I said I was going to do this. So I did it. That being said. I don't really love how I did this. I want to be a little bit more concise. A little bit more written. Let I don't want to do scripts. I suck with scripts. Not really sucked with them. I just. I like being able to go off the dome and free flow a lot more. Um, so. Next time this is going to be a very different type of video so um i apologize if it's not necessarily your cup of tea um that being said i think today i'm going to release alongside this the uh first three episodes of the world of remnant and uh yeah so thank you guys so much for watching if you don't mind like comment subscribe actually i didn't give you my last fucking thoughts i'm stupid i'm not stupid but you know what i mean yeah so i honestly think that to just sum up everything that I've been trying to say this whole time. This whole season from our first opening intro to our last fight to every big moment is just... It's Monty and the team showing what they can do. It's saying like... this. It's, it's a team of creators stepping into... Not maturity, but stepping into themselves. Like saying like, no, we could really do this. Same way their characters are stepping into themselves and saying, no, we could really do this. Like, every single character in this season had a moment where they just kind of stepped into themselves. Except for Cardin. Because Cardin's a piece of shit. But, like, the rest of them did. They had moments. They had something to say, like, look, like, this is, this is what could be. And that's ultimately what you want out of a first season. You want the world building. You want the, well, this is what could be. And you want the spectacle because that's the only way you get a second season. So, like... Typically speaking, your season three and season four is going to be the best in television. Um, because by season three to season four, that's usually when you find your main writers. That's normally when you find your footing of what you want to say and like all that stuff. So if you look through like most sitcoms and most television, season three or season four is typically the favorite. Um, just due to that. But that's really unimportant uh again thank you guys so much for watching um i have an announcement i'm gonna make the announcement for ruby volume two so the most amount of you hear it um yeah but thanks peace out